as we'll finish up, you're going for an interview with Calm soon, aren't you? The, <coughs> yeah, I mean... That's fantastic, by the way. Well, let's, Isn't that a story in itself? It's a story about... Uh, Calm uh, have given me a bit of stress. <laughs> That's the irony, isn't it? That's the irony. So it's not going to go... It's <laughs> stressful dealing with calm. It's not going to go exactly <laughs> as I wanted, but there is an interview and some other stuff. But crucially, the song, everything in there is research and stuff that helped me. Killer, killer, podcast. Killer, killer, official .com. <laughs> you need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. Killer, killer. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer, killer podcast. Oh, that's harsh. Harsh. The friendship in here runs deep. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, Central London or Central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be. You don't want to be anywhere else. Trust me. Big shout out to all the original sharing is caring. You know what time it is? It's that time of the year where we should be getting bigger and bigger meaning. Tell a friend to tell a friend. Hold tight to graffitikings.co.uk. Big shout out to everyone's got the television app, free download, street culture. That's what we're all about on that app. We're on about on this show. Yeah, I've got some special guests inside the place. It's a it's a combo. It's a combo. I've only got two mics to work with it. <laughs> We've all records and that's definitely inside the place. We have uh, two uh, members of the camp, shall we say. Jester, De Jester Jacobs, um, one hello comedian, MC, rapper, uh, artist in his own right. And then, of course, we have production Supernova, uh, London Zoo's original, the mighty forms inside the place. How are we, gentlemen? Good, bro. Wonderful, Good. wonderful. Yeah. Thank you for having us. I didn't call you an arsehole then, but you said artist. Oh. <laughs> Who, me? Yeah, I nearly, I thought he was going to slip up. But... <laughs> hey, listen, I treat them with the greatest respect. I mean, the thank banter you. banter is red hot already from you. Already, bro. You guys are scary, because, I mean, I've had comedians in before, right? I mean, Who? Who have you had? Right, so I've had... I'll decide if Super, they're a comedian. Super's come through, yeah, and right, you, I'll tell you what it is, you've <laughs> got to be very careful. Right. You've, got to, you've got to be very... Careful, because yeah. you're, mm. you can't out-banter a comedian. Just hands down, it just doesn't work. Bro, it's a nightmare working with this guy sometimes. It's like, he just never laughs. And it's like... But That's... he laughs at the most random, fucked-up stuff out of nowhere. Like what? I don't know, bro. I just remember just those, that, those sessions. It was just like, you're, you're so funny that it's really... It's, it's, it's hard around you, bro. I ain't gonna lie. You drain man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. oh, he said he drained, man. Oh, Absolutely hilarious hard. to have that from you, of all people. <laughs> <laughs> fucking human drain. Can you curse on this? I'm not going to curse is, this anymore. Is, this, yeah, is, you know, this is your PG. guys' podcast. <laughs> no, I, lo I love you, Keith, but you're, you're a fucking nightmare. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why don't you share with the listeners the one thing you're supposed to bring to this that you failed to do? I brought you. No, the sound card. No, 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 no. Because then we would have had three mics. Banging, bro. Three mics would look stupid, bro. I made a, an executive decision, bro. It's all blessed. Jester, what's the, what is the comedian that genuinely makes you laugh it frequently? Would, it would be Norm MacDonald, R.I.P. Ah. He just put out a special yesterday that he recorded prior to his death. <laughs> he did it in his living room like when, this. When did, did he die? He died, oh man, a few months ago. I was watching my friend do Live at the Apollo, mm. good comedian, Tom right. Ward. Okay. And uh, I got some texts from a bunch of people because they know that I love the guy. And they were like, Norm, Norm, Norm. I was like, fuck. Couldn't believe it. He had cancer for nine years and didn't tell anybody. Wow. Nine years. I think it's nine, yeah. Many years. And yeah, that just makes me love him even more because that's the ultimate Norm joke, really, that you were actually dying the whole time. It's, a, it's well, yeah, when it's... It's a it's it's a heavy thing to carry, isn't it? Absolutely, I would uh, I would take it like the coward I am. I would tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'd want benefits. Uh, yeah. You know, like I'd like need. I want. I'd want more gigs out of it. Mm. Everything. Mm. I wouldn't wait mm. till I was dead. Yeah, yeah. It's a very humble way to go, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And he's just the funniest man ever. Funniest guy. That's my favorite comic. Uh, I like Bill Burr too. Yeah. Who else? Bill Burr's awesome. No one in England. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, <I'm joking. laughs> no, who was it? If there was a, what was the name? Was the, the Irish comedian? There was an older Irish comedian. I mean, this is I'm going going in a bit broad there, Kells. But what a, <laughs> there was there was this guy back in the mid nineties that used to always be on TV. 
uh, grey haired guy, glass, I think he had glasses, or he's had a cigarette in his hand. He was awesome, man. Was it Summit Allen? Didn't he have like a thing? Allen, was something? it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keith Allen. Keith, yeah. Like, yeah. Not Keith Allen, it was someone, Summit Allen. I know who yeah. you Yeah, comment below, you'll know what I'm talking about. Yeah, he's yeah. A, the guy that would sit in the armchair and just say stuff. Right? No, 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 that's, that's Father Ted, isn't it? I, uh, <laughs> I know who you mean, though. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, George Carlin, that's another, there's another bona fide, I would say, that I would put him in the, the high ranking of. Yeah, I haven't watched too much Carlin. People try and make me put me on to him, but I haven't done it yet. Oh, really? He's mm. great in Bill and Ted. Yeah. Bill I haven't seen Bill and Ted. Well, he's in the first two, isn't he? Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about him until years later when I found out he was a comedian because the internet came about, and I was like, oh, that's the guy from Bill and Ted. Yeah, that's true. I I had the same sort of experience. Uh, you, great comedian. There was an era, a whole era of, of our childhood, especially in the mid to late nineties, where you suddenly wake up to the fact that technology's taught you something. Yeah. More yeah, than yeah. it does now. It's like, yeah, what? So what? That person was that all yeah, along. Yeah. I had no idea that he did that as well. Mm -hmm. It's like it all becomes one big tapestry, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, this tapestry, tapestry can also be uh, uh, transcended into this subject that we're getting into right now. Uh, you guys. You've got a lot of guises, got a lot of hats that you put on, haven't you? You've got, obviously, we've got the comedic values, we've got the production, we've got the different crews that we've all you know, partaked in, obviously, Revorg, Hold Tight, Reaver, Vorg, and... Moose the... Funk Squad. I get told I don't shout it out enough, so I'm just getting it. Okay, I'll just pretty <laughs> shout it out just so randomly. Like, Particularly so archetype from Moose, he says, I never mention it in interviews. Uh, any podcast I'm on, I forget to mention it. So exactly. while that's on my mind, I'm in, I'm in Moose Funk Squad. Yeah. We have a... A project, National Geographic shit, that's very good. Other projects are available. Do you Moose see what I'm Funk Squad. So for those of you who are just joining us in the, the intro to these gentlemen, it goes without saying, like, you you guys can't just hold hold it down on one straight project, can you? you you're fully creative force of doing all sorts of stuff. Yeah, no, fully. I mean, I've been, through, even when we're working on this, I mean, this record took me and Joe a few years. And name the record. The uh, Grindfulness, yeah. It took us a few years to do this, purely because... Like, Joe's a really funny guy, and comedy rap is a real funny area. Mm. And it can be not good music within a year if you don't tread a very fine line of what the jokes are or, or how you approach the jokes. So with this, it was... It took a long time, didn't it, bro? But we, like, we made maybe, maybe like, 50 tracks, and we took it down mm. to 10. And I think we made another side EP called State of the Art, which is out on Shadow Player Records. Go check that out. But it was about like, you know, just getting it down to 10 really important ideas. And then Joe sort of started weaving this thing about mental health through it in a really interesting way. Yeah. You know, it really, yeah. It, 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 you it's know, not it was... really a funny album. It's fun, like some of the themes are funny. Some of the lines are funny, but it's, it's actually it's a really... very serious album. <laughs> it's a pretty dark <laughs> album. Yeah. It's got a nice happier ending, I'd say. But the whole thing is kind of s flipping tropes on their head, really. So there's a song about you know, partying with pills, but it's about anti, what are they, antidepressants. Yeah. Big up the antidepressant crew. So it's like about, instead of, uh, what are the ones that people take? Zans. Like Zans and... Um... I've never had a Zan. Nah. No. Or lean. I'd like both, if possible, at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Just to see what it's like, really. Yeah, I've heard that the, uh, the lean particularly is delicious. Mm. I just, I've just got, Keith has had it. I got introduced to Wagwan drink today. Wagwan drink? Yeah. Have you never had this thing? It's a 17.5 proof alcohol in a small, like, smaller than a Purdy's bowl. Wow. This thing is designed to take you to one place and one place. <laughs> that sounds like. amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where'd you get it from? Corner shop. Wagwan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you go in and just ask for someone? Did he say, I've got some Wagwan? Yeah, it's like the same price as a bottle of wine. Who introduced you to Guaguan, though? Give Rinsa. I'll take Rinsa alone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I've never seen this in my life. I would, I'm would. i going to pick some up. I'm going to take you to my dealer afterwards. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, yeah I'd some imagine... Some Zan and some Guaguan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some Zan. Is that how you do it? Yeah, is it some Zan? Some Zan. I like some Zan, please. Can I have some Zan and a Guaguan, please? <laughs> um, mental health. Yeah, I think, mm. I think we've all been at that point or the juncture in our life where you... The, the vacancy in your head, the, uh, well, it's all internalised. That's Fully, the first thing. It's like, only going on in that head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you think that it's written that way and it's playing out to a normal, everyday yeah, yeah. scenario, but it's not. Hmm. It's almost like uh, it becomes an echo chamber, doesn't it? Fully, fully. 
I mean, we we were one of the tracks on this album, the the, the title track, Grindfulness. Um, <coughs> We made the track and Joe came to with the concept of making a really angry sounding rhyme tune about self-help and relaxation, mm. but in a really aggressive way, mm. you know, and the tone being aggressive, but everything that comes out of mouth is really about how to help yourself, mm. really, really internally help yourself, you know, without, you know, just in yourself, how you, things you can do, mm. but, you know, but so the juxtaposition of the angriness and the thing really sort of, and then that's how we would lead into actually the thing to do with Calm, that he's, he's got an interview with um, Calm, the mental health charity, because when we were doing the video for that track, I think actually when, when I finished the song, Joe said, I'd made the... But, you know, I don't really make too many grime tunes. I made this grime tune. He's like, all right, now can you make a 30-second ambient part for the ending? And I was like, okay, <laughs> cool. So I just had to make this weird ambient Brian Eno-esque type mm, of ending. Mm, mm, mm. And when we were doing the video and we saw all the sh sort of the, the shots from the video and the, from the early versions, it was like, oh, it'd be a really good idea to put up just the char charity names at the end of the video in this calm bit. Mm. You know, just just to just to, and then uh, and then Joe said, oh, maybe we should reach out to Calm. And then now we're at a point where you're, you know. You might as well finish up. You're going for an interview with Khan soon, aren't you? <coughs> yeah, I mean that's fantastic, by the way. Well, that's, isn't that a story? In it's a story about Khan uh, have given me a bit of stress. <laughs> that's <laughs> the <laughs> irony. Isn't it? That's the irony. So it's not going to go. It's been stressful dealing with Khan. <laughs> it's not going to go exactly <laughs> as I wanted, but there is an interview and some other stuff. But crucially, the song, everything in there is research and stuff that helped me, like. I would say that the album is actually a sequel probably to my first ever album, which I did in 2008, called Mental Disorder. And I wrote it, like, probably in the grips of a lot of undiagnosed mental health issues, like drug abuse, fucking depression, anxiety. And it didn't even... No one was talking about mental health. No, just wasn't now there. it's just a yeah. buzzword and people throw it around like it's nothing. Yeah. But at that time, especially not rap music, I'd never heard anything talking about that kind of stuff. So I was very... Mm honest and open I never knew that yeah like that was I had a lot of uh, I remember that album that was the first time I heard one of your tunes I remember mm -hmm. that album a wow. lot of stuff about that there was a song on there about pills mm. ecstasy pills I was fucking beaning up all the time but really like dealing with the aftermath of it and then it's funny that the, this album goes full circle and it's kind of I feel like I'm a lot more comfortable understand myself a lot more in, um, I'm in tune with my abilities with songwriting mm. and what I'm trying to do. Very the first cool. one was like a fluke, and yeah. this one is, you know, it took a long time, but I really feel like they're a good companion piece. What's the calm down of taking ecstasy? Is there a calm down? The fucking was for me. Was talk for to me, me about that. Well. What it's was horrible. the. What it took to me about that? I mean, look, yeah, it depends. But back, I mean, I haven't done ecstasy in a long time, but the, the day He's after. He's still on one of his come downs. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but the day after was always just a real mental struggle. I mean, it's a self imposed one. Mm. So you've only got yeah. yourself to blame for it. Do you I know had, what I mean? There's no I feeling too sorry for it. Yeah, exactly. There's no. I had to. Uh, sorry. I had to stop taking kind of a lot of the weirder drugs because when I started doing comedy, it would just remove any faculties I had for being an adequate comedian mm. like the serotonin would be so depleted mm. if you're getting heckled if I wasn't on a come down I'd be able to say well yeah well but because I had a big sesh mm. it was all just, just the synapses <laughs> burned <laughs> away someone would say you're shit and I'd say yeah I am actually I'm awful <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough I'm getting my hat <laughs> yeah uh, there's some balances in life that you've just got to accept as part of your uh, whether they're positive or negative, they're part of your personality traits. And like, mm. if you if you're if you're really quick witted and able to like snap at somebody who's snapping at you, yeah, remove that, and it's like it's like removing a joint, isn't it? That's just <laughs> that, that's part of the comedian DNA, isn't it? Lately, I've been watching some of your reels, and it's all been you really quick witty yeah, that's reaction what with the yeah. with the audience. Yeah, so, uh, they're really good reels, man. Thanks, man. Yeah. I, I'm doing reels now. <laughs> I'm trying to do five years later. Yeah, I'm trying to do <laughs> reels. TikTok in four years. No, I'm on TikTok. <laughs> oh, are you? Okay. Yeah, I just put the reels on TikTok. <laughs> how know? much of it? How much of it do you care about that kind of thing? I mean, for music and for comedy, it's how sad, much? Well, it's sad how much you have to not, not care, but it's sad how much you have to be aware that it will affect how your product will be heard and where and when, yeah. and if yeah. you know that you know there was. There, there was an artist I saw recently on, on, on TikTok, funny enough, that came up on my, um, on my Instagram and it said, and it was showing her talking about how she sold 125 million records for, for, for big record labels. I don't know who the artist was, an American singer. And she said that the, the new song that she's had a video for for like three months, they won't release it until she does a TikTok. Yeah. 
Yeah. So the TikTok was actually her talking about how she's mm. got mm. to do a TikTok, yeah. and it was so she could release it. But I was like, wow, like genius labels, marketing. It was pretty smart, but just the fact that record labels now expect a TikTok with a big thing is insane. You know, TikTok's the biggest platform, right? Yeah. I'd imagine it looks yeah, like I had, it. I had the, the, the fans on Instagram, <coughs> but the industry's on TikTok. Wow. So I had to believe. I can barely cling to Instagram and stay sane. I don't know. I can't do a bit of any of that. With, um, with rap and the add on of uh, drug taking, or the drug of choice, because obviously that moves with generations, right? I, I was. I watched this, um, and I'm sure you may have been, you know, you may have watched this as well, but I saw this uh, excerpt on Reels or something. I think it was a, it was a pundit. It wasn't anyone too up there, American guy, and he was explaining that in in the in the early noughties it was all about the Fifty Cents and those kind of that era of rappers yeah, yeah. selling the drugs. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then the new generation of the mumble rappers are the kids that have had yeah, the yeah, drugs. Yeah, they became the drug. They became. That's what I remember talking to Mongo about that. Funny enough, a couple of years ago, that exact same thing about how it's funny about how it's. It's switched full circle, and it's actually the the abuser is now the star, mm-hmm. whereas before it was the guy that was selling to 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 to, to help someone be an abuser, yeah, to yeah. be abuser, you know, to be an yeah. Sometimes they do both though, sell and use. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of it as well just goes is 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 the way that the whole internet has affected music and given everyone a platform, and mostly people who can afford to do these sort of drugs and put them online can afford to do that and the people mm. who were rolling from the streets back in the day when we were in, into it mm. they're not really giving a shit about doing that sort of stuff no. you know so it's yeah it's a, it's it's a hard one isn't know? it crazy about the dynamic of music and the way that even living in london like you have to have you have to find that money somewhere to make mm. ends meet to make the music yeah, work for us because the working class of it all you know yeah, these yeah, are the ones that just, suffer the most because they yeah. can't get their their, their word out that's something else worth mentioning about with music in this album. Like after the first album I did, it was the first one, so it was all fun making it, great putting it out, no expectations. And then I'd say the following like in ten years, I had the expectations of where I wanted it to be and where it would take me, mm-hmm. who would hear it, blah, 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 you know, and then the reality has to meet the expectations. But uh this was the first one where I kind of accepted my lot and it's just enough to do the music that's enough of a privilege and some people if you don't clock that soon like i think that's why it probably took so long in it because we were just enjoying the process for a few years of just you know and it was a really strange process for me because joe would come because his songs are so sort of well they're like stories in some ways Mm. especially for this record um they came well written already on paper most of them you know a lot of the time he didn't he might have wrote a couple of ideas in in the spot but more time he would come with pages of the songs written Mm -hmm. and he'd be like right i wrote that to an lp beat can you do something like that or i wrote that to a dre beat can you do something like that and it was like the worst nightmare of a producer for someone to come and say those sort of big boy names and it's like yeah make an lp beat make a fucking dre beat for me Mm -hmm. quickly and it but he's the only person i've ever done that for where i've I've actually backward engineered the song because to me it's usually like I bring my part to it, you connect with it, mm. and we make the song calm. But it was because of the way Joe wrote, it was like I can't really work like that. I've got mm. to adapt to his. He wrote to these flows and these tempos, so I've got to follow the tempo. Mm. So I'd pull up the LP beat, find the kick and the snare, dash that off, and then just make a beat around that. And that, that, most of these beats were, you know, I'm not going to really? say what. I'm not gonna, yeah, Gabos was him saying. Make oh, yeah. a Dre beat. The last track we ever made on the for the record, Sad. he came round and he played. What was it? The Eminem. He was. I was like, what one is that? The one from the Eminem second album. What was it? Who knew? Who knew? So we had to get up. Who knew? I had to listen to it just to get the pump in my head because he'd already written the song to it, and then I just backwardly made the song. So all of the mode. I think only a couple of them, like the intro with Brick Top on. I I had already made the, the the drilly type beat. That happened. That actually was your idea in the studio. The Brick Top. Right? Yeah, they were meant. The Brick Top was meant to be a skit, wasn't it? Yeah. And I, and I found it funny that he was cussing hip hop in our skit. I was like, you know what? I'll just let me make him into the beat. Yeah. I'll make him. So he's like, you know, yeah. so. I suppose someone actually held a copy of this. I mean, it's yeah, we'll leave that here if you Great, man. Thank you. Um, I'm a man. I love that tune as well. That... Thanks, hey, Bosh. Yeah, man. Look, I'm, can I. Let me delve a little bit more into this production value of it all because I was mm. just looking at the side notes here and, like, you literally have mixed, you mixed it all as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I'm curious because you, producers are often 
seldomly kind of in the forefront. To, to have one in a chat. With, with, with the MC. <laughs> what do you right think now? I'm here today for? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, you know, you don't normally get the MC and the producer sitting at the table. Yeah, so yeah. It, it's, I'd like to get a bit more into like that, so it's going to be all right. Jay, it's going to be all right. He's doing... <laughs> the worst is over, trust me. <laughs> but like, what, what's, what's the mechanics behind it? Like, what do you look for in an MC? What is it that, what is it that... To be honest, I actually looked for him years ago. So what it, I, I mean, firstly, your voice has got to really connect with me. Really connect. Vo just the sound of your voice. Because most of the times when I hear songs, I don't even listen to the lyrics the first three times. I'm just listening to how it interacts sonically with mm -hmm. the track. And then, then I'll start listening to what they're saying. And then hopefully that's the last mm -hmm. thing. And it's like, oh, God, thank God he's not talking shit. And he wasn't. And you, I remember I got a remix when I was working with... I was working with Congo Natty years ago in Brixton Jam upstairs in the studio and we had the same manager and he was m m releasing a group called Granville Sessions, was it? Mm. And they had Joe as a feature and they were making a remix album and I was like, oh, can I remix Domino's? And I was like, who's that guy? Who does verse three? Mm. And I was like, oh, it's a guy called Joe. So they sent me his thing and I was like, I downloaded his albums illegally. And then... Um, yeah, just then just messaged him, and this is like ten years Lone ago. Lone Warrior, we're talking. Yes, yeah, Morpheus times, bro. <laughs> if you know, you know. Yeah, the fucking good old days. But um, so then he came. We just we it took years for us to actually make music though. I was going through a lot of turmoil with family things, and he was you know we we just hadn't connected. When I that yet. we first yeah. did a song, we were in Chad's studio. That's it. Yeah, we were in some guy's studio actually. I think he was out. And I remember house. doing the song, but. I was I was really in a bad place and I wasn't I just was I wasn't down for. I remember any it music. took us a long time to because it was it had just become about us becoming like quite enjoying each other's company in the yeah. studio, and it evolved to be like, you know, it was just really weird how it happened. It was just all of a sudden Joe come and said, "Look, these these because I had the fifty songs and they're just a blob of music and mm. it's quite hard to." But he just came. He's like, that, "This might be the ten and they're all about this. And I was like, oh, shit. I think we'd, made, you know, we'd made some of them six months before. Mm. But until Gabos came and the Dr. Dre sound in one, it was like, okay, that's the 10 now. It doesn't sound like Dr. Dre. It doesn't right? sound nothing like Dr. Dre. Like it some... cringes me to listen to, but, you know. What, that one? The fact that it's like me even saying that it's like it was inspired by a Dre beat. Well, uh, it, it was only in the sense that I said, I've been writing to this song. It's a banger still. Yeah, I'll man. Be, I'll be honest <laughs> with you, that is such a conceptual way of making some music. Yeah, it was I, mean, I don't know if it's a good way. <laughs> it it worked with me away. for the time, yeah. I wrote um, the song over Who Knew by Eminem why, like, why he's rapping over it. I'm writing... So you didn't have the instrument. Yeah, well, I know I'm not, not to do that quite often. I don't know how you guys do okay. that. It's a weird one. It doesn't always happen like that, but it can. Cause doesn't, I just, you know, doesn't, doesn't the rhymes that you're listening to get in the way of your own No, rhyme? man. It's, 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 it's kind of weird. It's kind of like I'm trying to compete with, <laughs> with who's, who I'm listening to in a way. It's whatever works. That's fucking cool. I've heard, uh, yeah, there's all different mad things that happen with songs. Sometimes mm. they come real quick, like the Grindfulness song was written very quickly. Mm. You just get an idea and it's like, yeah. And like I did the dog rap, I wrote that when I was in the office. Really? Like 20 minutes. These are the zeitgeist moments which propel you to want to do more. It's that, that this is it, the... we're all, but we're all the way through this, he's, you know, I'm working with other artists while I'm making this record as well. He's he's doing comedy shows every other fucking moment he can get time to. You know, there's it's it was almost like it was the background to our to us working, if you know what I mean, and it sort of came naturally, you know, rather than this sort of pushing to make a record because Yeah, that's right. It was no we would have we would have been making it for another few more years if I hadn't just said, All right, we've got yeah, to, that's it. And yeah. We've got to try and take it home. Yeah. It was just one, one, two more songs. I was like, if I just write this here and this here, balance the record out well, tie right? it up. Mm -hmm. But like I said, when we did the first one at some guy's place, that song is called Thick, off the it's EP. Of the art EP, yeah. And that was the only song. I was like, all right, that's all right. I like that. But then after that, I think there was a gap of about two years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> two years. I'm a nightmare. It's like if I, if, if I don't like some, like. I'm just a nightmare when it comes to that. If, if I'm not feeling, back. if I'm not feeling the track a hundred percent, it won't get finished. Really? Yeah. I wasn't I even really. I wasn't even really starting like anything. It. Yeah. Was, yeah I, was, I just wasn't making music. I wasn't pursuing anything really. Same it's with Mongo. Really when I was working with Mongo, when I first started working with Mongo, Mongo, a few years. Yeah. Shout out to my family. Mongo. Mongo. Um, yeah. It was around the time me and Joe started the first sort of sessions, and um, it took me ages to get a track out of Mongo that I liked. They were great tracks, but mm. it was like I haven't got that. The mm. one. The, uh, 
You know what I mean? Yeah, the, I the, the, the fucking Mongo track, you yeah. know? And then once we got one, it's like, boom, I know exactly what to do for you now. Mm. And, we, and we've like, I've made the Sniff and Mongo album. I've got his album sort of 80% there. Um, but he's such a great... He's artist. incredible. Like, I've, I've written sing, some of my best can, music. Yeah, that, there's the a... growl yeah. on his voice. He is he's, a don. He's, he's yeah. an absolute G. Like, shouts to Mongo. That's my mm. brother, man. Met him through forms, and I'll never forget, I was living in Finsbury Park at the time, and he gave me a ride home. Oh, shit. After yeah, a studio session, yes, he gave me a ride home and he's giving me like, it was like a guided tour of UK rap when he was coming up. Like, <laughs> you know, he used to hang here, post up here. And it's fucking Stop mad because I listened to him when I was a kid before I ever started rapping. Yeah. That was one of the first voices. Mongo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so who the fuck are these dons, man? Yeah. yeah so it's real. crazy. It's surreal when you end up working with people like that, and that's why yeah. like my, 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 it's about like getting the best because I couldn't put a half ass Mongo track out as, as forms yeah, because after fan all first. these years. Yeah, I was a fan of what he did, and I know the levels mm. as yeah. a fan. I know yeah. the levels it has to hit, and it's it's so easy to very easy to go underneath those levels because they set such a high standard at the time. You know, they did. They really oh. did for a London rap crew what they did. And if you, you know. have not checked out Mud Family, you can, obviously you can go and check out the podcast. Mud you can Family. find a lot more. They're all on the, the, yeah. the Killer Cow platform, but also. Some of their the pedigree, like you say, they set standards. Yeah, all all of through like all the fibery like, that that whole movement that happened was really important to me when it happened. When I well, I think I might have not seen it happen, but I was into like the Ronin records and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Just Deck just around, yeah, yeah, fully. Yeah. It shouts to Axilla. Yeah. Um, so it was really surreal to end up in the studios with these people over mm. the years because mm. it was never planned. It was always just. You know yeah. how it how it worked out, but it, yeah, it's been it's been a real blessing. Like, I can't wait to release the Mongo album. It, it's such a it's so it's just so different. How much of that is right place at right right time though, boys? Like because some of it is like you follow your north star. It fully is that, bro. Is... Down the road from here, right? I, I remember I had my I, I was working with a singer. First thing I'd ever worked with. I didn't even know how to track vocals back then. I was just blagging it, right? And she liked one of my tracks, and she could clearly see I didn't have the couldn't record at home. So she's like, come to a studio. This is at the time I'm buying Ronin, um, Low Life, all of that sort of era. Mm. I'm buying the vinyls as they're coming out. I go to this studio, as you're getting back to your point at the right place, right time. I walk into this lift and she's like, yeah, we're on the third floor. I press the button and it's Ronin Record Studio, bro. So I'm walked in and there's like Johnny Turnbull there, which is Mad Money Wire, I think, is if, I, if I'm right. Wow. And I walk in and I'm just like, what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I what am I doing in what, here with it you? It was just so surreal, bro, because <laughs> it was like the first studio I end up in just to help this girl record some vocals was Ronin Records. Mad. And she didn't know I liked them. Yeah. It was just a friend of a, you know, one, yeah. someone she knew. So yeah, right place, right time. Yeah. It's like that gave me like, okay, there's some omen shit here. Mm. I, you know, I had long red fucking Paolo Coelho's fucking alchemist and all of that, <laughs> that, that thing of the, you know, believing in the omens. Yeah, and yeah all of that, yeah. You know, that, so there is some truth in that, I believe, is, you know. Mm. Otherwise it's just chaos, isn't it? Yeah, the whole time. <laughs> but you know, there's some moments, like you say, in your life where you're just like, this is exactly where it should be. Yeah. You can feel yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Do we any of that, Jester? Any of that? Yeah, I did. I did. Uh, when I did my first bit of TV, comedy on TV, mm. I had that. It was a very. Uh, yeah, it was, it was... was that the Harry Hill stuff? <laughs> the Harry Hill show, yeah. Because <laughs> I, did, I did a gig with Harry Hill. I didn't have an a agent or manager and. I was like, just thinking, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm never. This might be as good as it gets, which is fine. Had a good show, and then Harry's like, "Can you do my TV show?" I was like, "All right, sure." And I did the show, and I had a moment before I was about to go and do the set on stage, and I just remember feeling grateful. I was like, because I was chasing something like this for years, and it took me about nine, ten years to get it. Mm. But I remember thinking if I'd have had a little break earlier on, two, three years in, like some people I know have, I would have been a fraud. I wouldn't have been ready. I wouldn't have had the comedic ability to do myself justice. Mm. But in this moment, I was completely zen, comfortable, ready. And that, I didn't... That 10 years is a big thing. That number, I think, is really important. Yeah. Just getting your head down for 10 years. You but know, like, it, it, years. I reckon like a year before that or two years or three years in, I would have been real nervous and like, fuck, imposter, what am I doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in that yes, moment, I, I was like, you know what? I'm, I just need it. I, I am dead inside, but all <laughs> I needed to do was just arrive and then, you know. Yeah, I've you've done, done the work already. Right. Yeah, it's about doing the thing. So yeah, um, I would agree with that. And going back to the social network of it all, like, you have to do the 
Ten, right. I think it's ten years, man. You've got to do it. You, anything else is fifteen minutes of fame, isn't it? You just got to. Yeah. Well, well you say that, but some of these kids just do their ten years online in front of cameras. Yeah, true. They smack it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I think that, that's shifting a bit, but. Yeah. Maybe as a, a live performer. or so Your thing's like an art form that you have to evolve. That thing of using technology is a bit different to that. Do you know what I mean? You, learning to use technology and having a bit of a quirky personality as opposed to learning how to write jokes, learning how to write bits, learning how to observe. That's a whole... You have to take time to do that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you have to be, to be thrown into it. You, you know? Yeah, you've got to be thrown into it. Sometimes I wish I was just a vlogger that could f fucking do react to videos and make my yeah. life a bit easier, but... You do get some chops on the live circuit that you wouldn't get yeah. from talking to a camera just in your room. Right. And it's different. And I like to think that live performances are different and people will still gravitate towards them, yeah. whatever. You know, it's just it's something about being in the room. Mm, 100%. So, yeah, fully is a different connection. Yeah, 100%. How much, um, because we don't <coughs> have to change heads mm -mm. on our shoulders to for new delegated jobs and how much of that do you reckon plays on the mental health because it it is like just constant convey about of next shit to do next shit to do next shit to oh, do bro, I've got two kids as well mate really so. <laughs> <laughs> like, well to be honest they're not kids anymore but they yeah so it's, it's, it's a, the thing is it's just that thing though isn't it and you know I saw you you know when you was doing your bits coming up you just gotta get your fucking head down mm -hmm. ten years or so you just gotta get yeah. you know and, and that, that's what, there's a period yeah. during that where it's like is this even Am I am I banging my head against yeah, the yeah, wall? Yeah. Yeah. But well, that's the thing you realize. Even if you're banging your head on the wall, it's better than yeah. not even giving it a punch. Not trying it. Imagine yeah. that. You know, no one lays there and you know regrets. I think so. Didn't that took me a long time to realize. Big up for that. It's like one. Big the journey. Puzzle, the journey is the best yeah. part. Yeah. Because I've had lots of nice opportunities, and you know, money's good, and mm. a bit of clout is all right. But if you yeah, don't yeah. give a shit. Yeah. You fit, you're always eyes on the next thing. You won't appreciate it, and it might never, might never come around again. It's yeah, for true. real. I had almost like a, a, a curse, and not not a curse, but I had a baptism of fire at the beginning when I started producing because I was working with like <coughs> with <coughs> Congregate, Alabama Free, and Tenor Fly, and I hadn't ever worked with any artists, and it was just a, a massive culture shock, you know, coming from. And at the time, I, I had a I had a full time job at Heathrow Airport. So I was juggling the dad thing, the Heathrow Airport Jeez. thing, coming to Brixton Jam on every one of my other days off to just for my own, off my own pee, mm -hmm. to just do engineering in the room for free, pretty much for a, for a, for a little while, just to get your foot in the door because it's a studio yeah, yeah. studio. You have to prove you fucking you can do the yeah, thing, you know. If you, especially yeah. if you ain't got no qualifications because mm -hmm. you've been working for the last ten years on the road. So I, you know, I had to learn by making so many mistakes. But you just battle through and, you know, and that's that's where a lot of personality can help, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> what was it like working in Heathrow Airport? Uh, looking back, I realised it was torture, but at the time it was just normality. What, what did you do there? Yeah, what um, did you do there? I always wonder how people end up in an airport working. It's very true. I think I was like 19 or something. I worked there for like 12, 13 years. At the first Jesus point, it was like, Christ. that's a long time. I was <laughs> fucking yeah, it was, <laughs> trust me, it was, but it was good money and it was a really interesting job. Okay, you know, it was like engineering work and stuff like that. Fixing. You're an engineer. Oh, I thought it was, it was like, like it was like engineering, like the, the the conveyor systems and stuff like that. That's sick. Yeah, it's like underneath the airport at Terminal One. There was like a two football size thing of conveyors. Everywhere. See, and you like know, the only thing I think is music video. When I think of places like that, bro, I I'm wish like... I could get in there. And I, Rob, I have dreams about that place still. Purely like, God, it'd be amazing to shoot a video up there. Really, is it crazy in those places? I tell you a Behind crazy story, right? Airport. It's scary. That's why I try and put as little stuff through the fucking package system as possible, <laughs> bro. It's scary. I'm oh, not joking. Oh, spice alert. Go trust. On. <laughs> yeah, trust. Now, there was this one time I remember, like, I was on a night shift and this this box, like, like sometimes, like, obviously, cake cases would just explode because they'd get hit by other cases or whatever. Yeah. And I remember just going up one day. Cases and explode? Were, well, just, just cases being moved along things. They, they, just they, bust, they back up into each other oh. and then they just, like, some of them bust open or whatever. If they explode, and I remember there was good. just, like... A whole box of records on the conveyor belt system, but these were like all original Blue Note, all original, some of the earliest stuff you no. could ever think of. Otis Redding, I couldn't even stop like reeling off names, right? The original vinyls that some idiot or some someone who didn't know just put it in like a big brown box. Oh no! I swear, bro, it was heartbreaking. Well, they all just smashed yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, and there was no like um, no information to get them back to him, so he'll never see that box again. Did you nick wow. them? Some. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the truth well, will I set didn't... you free. No, 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 I wouldn't. 
I wouldn't steal. <laughs> <laughs> to those that are listening and watching, there was a there was a glee in that eye there. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, I mean, yeah. you do. I I do worry. You know, I remember one time I was going through with a hard drive. You know, a playback hard drive. Right. And we ended up in Abu Dhabi. Right. Where we was going to do the gig. And Porn. They, they, no, nothing oh. like that. No, that's another story. That's but no, there was there there was this moment where we had to try and explain to them what it was because they weren't having any of it. Oh right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Never yeah. saw it back again. Oh, well, they had it. Yeah, they kept it. Fucking hell. Yeah, it's um, like eight hundred quid on that. Why like, did they keep it anyway? They mm -hmm. didn't want us to have it because they didn't understand what it was. They didn't know why it'd come through. They they didn't like the boxing of it. It was wow. just yeah. what did you have on that? I was just playback music stuff, you know. Fuck. Stuff you need. To, to make to perform. To, to perform yeah 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 <laughs> but you know going back to like having jobs and stuff and just you know you have to in this this you know in this in music mm. unless you're you know unless you're signed to a major label but yeah. most of us nowadays have resigned to the fact that you you can't that that, that world we thought was real mm. does not exist it doesn't exist, it doesn't exist. Yeah, you, you you've got to just enjoy what you do mm. and get through it and you know and try yeah. you know Try and you know, as we were saying, you were saying about mental health. You know, just try and do do what you can to not leave a negative imprint yeah. as any one of us moves forward. You know, yeah. there certainly is this wake up call for from people that, you know, that it's, it's, I know being nice seems pretty obvious, <coughs> but we're all bred, yeah. born, and lived a different life. Yeah, and for real. and and I think there's a level of acceptance that we will just have to find that you know. Just on balance, just yeah, do yeah. the best you can. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, as musicians and as a comedian, we have a responsibility, and as you do as an artist as well, that you need to be spreading positive... You need to be spreading something that will help move up something mm. positive, like what you do here, you know, like what Joe does with comedy, like what I try to what do, do with music, music, with the artists that I work right. with, you know. This, the album I did on Blah Records before this with Sniff, that was a real important record about anti-drugs. Yeah, big that up Blah whole, Records as well. Yeah, we in favor, there's no favoritism here. Big shout out to Blah all day. Yeah. Absolutely. But, uh, that, was a, that was really important that that record was about making drugs look shit. Mm. Really important that this was about not giving any glamour to this world, what you were talking about, yeah. of where now we are the, the consumer of drugs is the artist. Yeah. It was like, okay, we can take it from the angle, but we need to show the really shit side of it. 100%. And, and, that, and that to me is the only way you can sort of flip it into a positive is, is to try and educate rather than glamorise it. Yeah. 100%. Because they still want to hear it, these kids, do you know yeah, what I mean? So it's how do you skate along that line of shit they don't realise that we're actually yeah. talking about it negatively yeah, until like they've man. listened a few times and they sort of get that this isn't a good place to be in this yeah, record. Yeah, but it takes but, a couple you of know? listens. Yeah, and that's, takes... that's, that's really important with what I do, you know, with the artists I work with. Because I, I know every rap, fucking rapper, you know, it's, it's, mm. I, I know mm. everyone to mm. a point. Mm. Mm. And, you know, some people reach out to work with me, some people just like, I reach out and I want to work with them. Sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. But uh, I'm just really about what mm. the record is going to be about and, and 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 is there what's the positive flip of this mm. record and the whole thing has to have its you know it has to be a, a piece within itself you know because <laughs> i won't get many chances to release records throughout my life the more i think about it with this level of control with the artist you, you reckon know? well it's get, it gets harder and harder to be able to make things like this because they're, they're they're you know it's quite niche to well i mean you, you i mean you guys very, are talking very niche isn't it you, you know you guys will certainly you, this has been playing in the background for a while in its development, hasn't it? There's yeah, yeah. I mean, it was wonderful. The other day I was at the High Focus, um, 12th birthday, whatever it is, their whatever birthday, oh, and someone, there? someone was Wicked. playing it on vinyl in, the, in room two. I think it was um, Shouts to Oliver Sudden. Oh, he he had on, the on, vinyl man. there and he pulled it out. I was like, wow, I've never seen one of my tracks played out, let alone as a, on the vinyl, you know? High Focus mm, so, as well, big up them, you know? Yeah, shouts to all them people, so, yeah. I think there's a, there's a real forward drive in positive. Mm, mm, Just actually. on what you were saying about how it's going to be rare for you to do it. I feel the same because there's so like it literally took years to make this. The records was it half an hour long. It's about thirty five. Yeah, it's and one yeah. side of a tape in my brain. And people <laughs> these days are putting out you know a couple episodes of a podcast a week. That's mm -hmm. an hour, two hours a week. Mm -hmm. So things seem more disposable than ever. Like who's going to? Thousand percent they do. Yeah. yeah. So it's almost like even I struggle to justify the time put into making mm. an album. Yeah. All the years and the yeah. hard work for like something that's 30, 40 minutes long on Spotify. I yeah. don't know. So, yeah. yeah. But what's left if there you. isn't... If well, exactly. I'm going to keep it. doing it regardless, but... Yeah. It's just it's just the thing. It's just finding the people that yeah. are in tune with what you want to do because, you know... At the moment, I got, I'm sitting on my next album yeah, probably exactly. out August 
and I'm at, I'm at the point where I still love it so much and I'm... You don't not, want to let go of it. Don't want to let go yeah. of it because yeah, yeah. once it's out and it's like a slave to the algorithm, you see yeah. the view count and, you know... It That's six months you get to live with your own records right. or, or however long they are. It's such a beautiful moment when oh, it's man. mastered and you're sitting there yeah. and you're like, yeah, there's a release date. It's like, it's mine for a bit. Yeah. The yeah. moment is gone. It's almost like... Two you know, weeks you know it's it, not clear. yours. Yeah, you just know it just doesn't sound the same once you know other people share it. It's, yeah. It still feels great, but there's just this little beautiful moment when it's yours. Mm. Before you let go of it, where it's only on your com- only on your fucking phone, mm. only you or the producer have it. Like, Who's that with? Talent, isn't it? That's coming out when? What? When did you say that record's coming out? August. August. It's a disposable we'll mentality, it. isn't it? What, what, like that, that, that can't live forever with the music. It has to no. change, man. Yeah. This... Probably won't be August. I just realised. <laughs> Schoolboy era, mate. Don't ever pronounce. <laughs> you made me. <laughs> <laughs> I think I said it first, but then I was thinking about it. Yeah, for... But now you started thinking about it. Everything's right? patterned though. We got couple of singles it's been ready for quite a while but uh, so different to this record i listened to it recently it's a really good record i think is it jack jack dan's produced it brilliant it's really me and jack good. dan's no features i wrote it in the lockdown ah when i had no see? job no use of time see well, i didn't have anything else going on and i i had so much fun writing it i was like thinking all live shows are done my mm. comedy career is done it's over because <laughs> yeah. i'm a pessimist i never actually thought really any of it would come back mm. at the beginning mm-hmm. I was like I'm trying to you. trying to make peace of it. People were like, no, it will come back. It'll take a year or something. I was like, no, 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 it's done. Like if a disease was invented to ruin this industry, COVID <laughs> was, the was the one. And all the signs were saying we're all fucked. Yeah. So I sat writing this album. I re- it was just me in a room, a little it's bit really of- cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's the funniest. It's way shit. funnier. It's way it's it's the funniest shit I've ever funnier than this. Ever done. Funny. Really? Funny. It's a really man. good record, man. And it's it's the backdrop of it. It's, nice. it's very it's the opposite to this. It's my backdrop's almost the comedy on this and yours yours is straight. But on this is like your Jack's like his backbone of that hip hop style just, was really good. I wanted to make I was like treating it like what if I only could make one more thing ever again? Yeah. What would it want to be what would I want it to be? And I wrote it so quick, a lot of the stuff was done in one take just sounds raw right. this is like very conceptual it took so long to really get into it but with, with this other one it was like a racing against time That's almost the best, man. completely different approach mm. completely different result and yeah it's coming out this year this year very soon it's all it was the vinyl plants delays man yeah Fuck i heard about me. this yeah like took in six months or something Six months, try nine to really looking like 18 it's or something ridiculous in some places right yeah. now it's mad yeah so we're waiting on the record. Hopefully, they will be with us October, November. But I just want to get it out. Yeah, yeah. Wait, I waited so long for the last one. Mm. Just get it out. It's though. horrible finishing that during COVID. It really was. Mm. <clears throat> uh, like I say, all positives. Yeah. You know. For real. For real. Mm-hmm. That's it. So that's your future, Jester. What about you, then, Forms? What's uh, what's uh, what's the future hold for you, young man? Well, I run a label called Shadow Player Records. So. That's, got, that's basically got a few releases coming out. I've got the Mongo, Mongo and Sniff album to come out soon. Just waiting to get some videos done for that. Nice. Got an artist from Sheffield, a young lad called Skint, who is amazing. Shouts to Skint. He's got some bits coming out. Sheffield, um, yeah. I work, I've, you know, I've probably worked with more Sheffield, Sheffield rappers than you than London yeah, rappers man, at this I'll point in my life. Crew. We've lined up from like mm-hmm. Trillion and Sniff to Skint. And a, who else? There's a couple up there. I think Kid, Green. Kid Acne I'm, I'm probably possibly going to be doing something with as well. Kid Acne, yo. Yeah, what a legend. Right. Absolute Long legend. Time. Amazing artist. Great name. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, no, shouts to the Sheffield crew. But mm. um yeah, so that's yeah, so Shadow Play Records, just got all that coming up really. Just um just basically I'm moving studio at the moment as well, so everything's sort of on hold for a couple of months, just why I sort of get a new place basically. Um but the Mongo and Sniff's probably gonna be the next thing. There'll be a Forms instrumental project at some point soon. Just uh yeah, man, just yeah, just running the label basically is the priority right now, really, you know. Yeah, Will we do another album? I'd love to. There you go. It's official, exclusive on here. Come on. What, might, what year might, is it out? Yeah, it's probably be another decade away. <laughs> but. Or at least another COVID outbreak. Come yeah, on. hopefully. Fingers crossed for another pandemic. Yeah, you know, yeah, I can really yeah, knuckle yeah, down yeah. with that. If there's a pandemic, I'm down. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, and on that fine note, two gentlemen that uh, do
do make sure you check out. Love, love people. Yeah, Peace. right there. Jester Jacob. Thanks Ford. for having us down. Thanks yeah, so thank much you. for coming yeah, through, guys. Thank, us, thank you. Thank you. I know you guys love it. Sharing is caring. Tell a friend to tell a friend, all right? Love is everywhere. Big up Calm as well. Big up Not too much, so. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, you stay lucky, people, all right? Crime don't pay, but neither do they. Don't talk to anyone I wouldn't. Peace. Peace.